Welcome to the Grace Abounding Broadcast, sponsored by the Congregation of the Shreveport Grace Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. My name is Ken Weimer, and it is my privilege to minister the Word of God for you today. May the Lord Jesus Christ be praised and exalted through the message preached, and may He, by His Spirit of Grace, grant ears to hear to each one He came to save, and ransom by His shed blood on the cross. Let's turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. There are many people that read James' epistle with misunderstanding. They presume it to be more of a book of works than of grace. But as you read it prayerfully, you see in it the work of Christ and how it is that he, by his grace, works in those that he has redeemed by his precious blood. But as you read it, you're reminded that we are sinners, sinners by nature, sinners still. And when you put a bunch of sinners together in a congregation, though they may be redeemed, you're still going to have trouble, such as our nature. So the Lord used James, who would have been one of our Lord's half-brothers. In other words, he, of course, was born of a virgin, but one of the siblings who initially, as you read in the Gospels, did not believe on Christ. And it takes the same work of grace to save a James as it does anybody else as a sinner. And so as James is writing here, you have to be reminded this is a time of great persecution in the first century. And many of these were scattered. That's how he begins his epistle there in chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not take any pride in being of that family in which Christ was raised as a half-brother. He calls himself a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the same with Mary, who birthed the Lord Jesus Christ, yet she was a sinner just like anybody and called Christ her Savior. So here he writes this to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, and he says, Greed. So it was written primarily to Jewish believers that were scattered abroad by the persecution there in Jerusalem, that God purposed that these should be settled throughout the then known world. And so James is writing to them about things that we all face in this life as the Lord's people. We live in this world, but we're not of it. And because we're in this flesh, we can expect conflict, not only with the world, but even amongst ourselves. And that shows us all the more why we need the grace of God, why we need his blood shed. But here in James 5, he's addressing primarily those that were persecuting the believers as they were scattered throughout the world. And so when he writes in chapter 5, go to now ye rich men. These would be like the religious Pharisees of the day that thought themselves to be blessed above others simply because they were men of wealth and used their positions to gain greater wealth compare it perhaps to preachers and pastors in our day that use their position to prey on the people and increase their wealth. You go out just on the internet, do a search, and look at some of these popular preachers' incomes and salaries and what their net worth is. It's just unbelievable. Where did they gain that wealth? Well, it was from the hands of 
people for whom they preach and preside. And so here's a warning that James gives to such men. He says, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. You know this would have been written just prior to Jerusalem being destroyed. God bringing the Roman army and completely wiping out Jerusalem and the temple. And these in their pride never thought that this could ever happen to them. And yet storm clouds were building even at this point when James was writing. And James remained in Jerusalem, even though these were scattered. He was the primary pastor there for the church in Jerusalem at this time. And so he warns them, verse 2, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten such as the end of any that make riches their end, their gain. And I'll tell you, there are a lot in religion that do. That's why they do it. It's because there's a lot of money in religion. We heard recently of a man that was whining and complaining because he felt like he needed a third airplane, such as the type of nonsense going on in religion today. But all of that is corruption. He says, your riches are corrupted. Taking anything the Lord gives for a self-serving purpose, especially in the name of the Lord, is an abominable attitude. He said, your gold and silver is cankered. It's a pretty strong word. It's Normally, gold and silver don't corrupt, but your gold and silver has to do with what they have earned off the backs of their followers, that it's cankered. It's, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. It's pretty clear here he's not talking about true servants of the Lord, but people in religion. And so remind there's nothing new under the sun. But we testify to and see today and all of these popular preachers that go about and they do it pretty strong well, all of that would witness against you. It shows right there they're not the Lord's. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. That's just another way of saying that their wealth building is nothing but fodder for the fire of eternal condemnation. He says, you have heaped treasure together for the last days. I believe James here may even have been speaking about those last days being imminent in the destruction of Jerusalem because nothing was spared. And the one thing on which they were making their wealth, the Lord purposed to be completely destroyed. And that was the temple. That's where they made their wealth. And now it was all taken away. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have raked down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. So here's a reminder that people today, preachers and others, take a work that they are doing and they put the Lord's name to it and yet they're doing it for their own gain. Here's a severe warning that such a way of living does not escape the all-sovereign, all-knowing God who is the Lord of Sabaoth. There's Sabbath, which means rest. Sabaoth means host. And so the Lord purposes that some live to a certain point, even in their corruption, in the name of using religion as their cover, but ultimately God sees all things. Unless a person has been chosen of God and Christ has paid their sin debt, like Saul, Tarsus, he was one of these that enriched himself in his religion, but it pleased God to stop him in his tracks and draw him out. 
Otherwise, there remains nothing but condemnation. People can't imagine or picture that, that hell will be filled with souls of men who follow such men as these, these promising them health, wealth, and prosperity. And yet, to their surprise, finding out that the very preacher that preached for them is also condemned with them altogether. He says here in verse 5, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. So feasting as if there is no judgment. That's part of the delusion. Christ spoke even in his day against these leaders. Woe unto you, you scribes and Pharisees. These were religious leaders. And saying here with James, this, this word here could be spoken of the majority of preachers preaching around the world today. That use the so-called ministry for their own gain. It says here, ye have condemned and killed the just that word means the justified ones. You can also read that the just one. These are the same that put our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. They crucified him. But when it says that he was delivered into wicked hands, it was these very men who delivered up the Lord Jesus Christ because they clung to their own self-righteousness. There's only one just one, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and those justified in him. So however you want to read that, you have condemned and killed the just, the just one, the justified one. Ever since Cain killed Abel, what was it over? It was over how God accepted sinners. It's only through a blood sacrifice. That was depicting person of work of the Lord Jesus Christ versus those that came with the works of their hands. So the same battle continued. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. In other words, even as Peter recommended the ones to whom he wrote in his day, that as Christ was persecuted, and they spoke evil against him, yet he answered not a word, but commended his soul to his father. So it is we. Men, we don't try to fight this battle with a sword to get people to change. We know that's the Lord's work to do. And we bow to our Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness is alone. And so he says, be patient, therefore, brethren. So in contrast to those that oppose, and the same spirit is in religion today. Some of the meanest people in the world meet in places of worship, much like what we do. They have the Bible. And yet, if you are to address them and speak to them of there only being one righteousness that God has ever accepted, and that is the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to get them upset. They believe that somehow something they do and how they live is a goodness before God. That's how they see it. He says, be patient, therefore, brother, under the coming of the Lord. I find this interesting because we know the Lord is coming at the end of time. But this was written specifically to people in the first century. Do you realize the Lord did come again in the first century? He said he would. When did he come? When he destroyed Jerusalem. He came in power and glory and destroyed that city, destroyed that temple. I believe as this was being written to those in the first century, that is where he says to be patient. The Lord has his day of judgment. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and had long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Verse 8, be ye also patient. In other words, no matter what affliction or trial we may face, to be patient.
Preparation means to wait under whatever the temptation or trial is. Don't try to get yourself out of it. The Lord direct. Establish your hearts. See, every affliction that the Lord's people face in this life is for the exercise of their heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth them. Again, I believe here in this context, he's speaking of that imminent judgment that was to come. Where the Lord himself said before he went back into glory. That when it comes, don't hesitate. Don't linger. It's like with Lot there in Sodom and Gomorrah. The angel of mercy had to come and take him literally out of the city. Don't turn back. All of that in Matthew 24 actually was fulfilled when the Lord caused the Roman government, Titus, to come in and destroy the city. They couldn't believe it. So the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I would say for us today, the Lord is coming in our generation. He's either coming to take us in death, that would be the execution of his judgment, because when he comes, he comes in death. We have people all around us, we read it in the opens. That's the Lord executing his judgment. And even for ourselves, who are the Lord's, he's coming in our generation. We're not going to get out of this alive. But it may be also that those that are alive when he comes, if it is in our generation that he comes again in clouds of glory to take his own unto himself, either way he's coming. And knowing these things to be so, our hearts to be established in that faith that he gives that of all those that he's redeemed he's not going to lose one that's our hope in light of that then he says grudge not one against another it's one thing for how the world treats the church but don't you be found as brethren that's who he's addressing here spiritual brethren to hold grudges against one another that's something you expect from the world and that spirit of antichrist. But as far as the church, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. I don't believe he's talking there about eternal condemnation, but he's talking about the very grudging of one another being in and of itself a condemnation where nobody gets along, each one thinking themselves better than the other. He said, Behold, the judge standeth before the door. There's only one judge of all, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When it says standeth before the door, it's talking about ever-present, never absent. And so in whatever manner it is, we're to live in light of who we are in Christ. We stop and think about how Christ took the sin debt of his people. And that sin was imputed to him. And thereby we stand forgiven before him in the work of Christ. How is it then that we treat one another? We don't impute. See, that's what it is to grudge one another. We don't impute to somebody else their wrongdoing. That's not how Christ has dealt with us. And he says there in verse 10, take my brother the prophets. So all of this goes back to the scriptures. Take my brother the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Suffering affliction at the hands of the world. It's one thing to be afflicted by the world, but it's another to afflict one another. As sinful creatures. No, we commend them. All this to our Lord. Behold, verse 11, we count them happy or blessed which endure. And you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Think about how Job was afflicted, even by his friends, so called. They were sure that there was something that wasn't right and he needed to get right, be right. It was all works 
advice that he was getting. And yet in the end, he was justified by God. God did all that for his learning. And in that, he could see how the Lord was very pitiful or merciful and tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, see, in the beginning, he's addressing all these that are like wolves preying on the church, the sheep. But now he turns it to these, his brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. In other words, again, fall into condemnation, not eternal condemnation, but being judged by your words. And some thinking themselves more spiritual perhaps than others. That's what it is to swear. Some thinking that if they just follow this path, then everything's going to be okay. Again, that's not within our power, any of us, to determine even a second from now how things are going to be. And when the Lord sends the winds of trials and affliction, that is purpose to drive the, the sail, that's the, the ship, into the harbor of Christ and not try to predict. That's what swearing is by heaven or by earth. If we do this, then this is going to be the outcome. We've got a lot of that kind of thing going on with preachers today. We call it sowing seeds of faith. It's all about getting you to do more and be better, and all these things, and produce a certain result. That's not in our power. It only leads to condemnation because there are a lot of people that are deceived thereby. He says, is any among you afflicted? But here again, it's a reminder that just because we're the Lord's doesn't mean we're not going to know trouble. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. In other words, address God himself. Let him be your refuge. Supplicate him. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. There's times where the Lord purposes affliction. There's times where he purposes merriment, but all the glory belongs unto him. Let him sing psalms. That's a good thing to do. Take the word as already inspired and sing these back to the Lord. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. When it says anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, this would be, in essence, like oil being of healing powers. That's basically what this was, that you pray for them, but you use whatever means the Lord has given to you for their healing. But do it in the name of the Lord. Don't put any confidence in the best, but in the Lord, in all cases. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. In other words, there's times where the Lord purposes that some of his children that he loves should be sick. And yet the prayer of faith, you ask, well, what's the prayer of faith? That's submitted unto the Lord, thy will be done. And it shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up according to his will. I like the thought, too, that even for one of the Lord's children, death is a salvation. Someone that's struggling and suffering their lifetime of it particular ailment. Just because they're a child of God doesn't mean they're not going to know sickness and affliction. But I remember when the Lord took a dear saint, I heard the preacher say, now nah, he's well now. No longer suffering. And that was how God answered that prayer. But the prayer of faith is to commend such a one, such ones unto him to do as he will. If the Lord purposes that they be raised up, they'll be raised up. If the Lord purposes to take them, take them. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. In other words, the Lord chastens his children sometimes because of sins in their heart and mind that we may not even know about, but it's the Lord's chastening. But it says they shall be forgiven, it's because they have been forgiven already in his bloodshed on their behalf. But 
confess your faults one to another. I believe that means confess to one another that you are equally sinners. We're not to think ourselves higher than anybody else. Confess your faults one another and pray one for another that he may be healed. It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You can read that as being a justified man who's not righteous in themselves. And it's the Spirit of God that gives the prayer. Without the Spirit, we don't know how to pray as we ought. This is the Lord directing through his people, but also, more importantly, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Avails much in that God always hears his prayer. We never need to doubt. When we pray according to the will of the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're commending that situation to him in all things. Gives us an example here of Elijah. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I believe Elijah was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. A man subject to like passions as we are. He was made like us he was tempted all things like us yet without sin there's a difference but the lord accomplished his purpose through him and so he does through his son today that's why we commend all things to him so he concludes brethren if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him see conversion is not just a one-time thing because i read this and i think my heart is constantly bent toward error. And the Lord will use one of his messengers, or it might be even one of his people, to speak truth to my heart, and my heart converted once again to him. That's an ongoing thing. That's why we're meeting here. We need to hear a word from the Lord. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. That's what conversion is. Those that God, by his Son, has redeemed, he continues to deliver them from the error of their way and the soul being saved from death. It says hides a multitude of sins. How does it hide? Well, God doesn't deal with us according to our sins. Thank you. Uh, those sins having been put to the Lord Jesus Christ, therein we stand justified in Him. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. It's a simple reading and yet so profound. May we see your grace and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that though we're of like nature as anybody else, yet in Christ's sake, we hear and answer. Prayer. And while you never condemn anyone, Christ is redeemed for their sin, yet we know that many times you will use our sin to correct us and chasten us by that sin. All that's designed to draw us again to Christ as the only hope of redeeming. That you grant us this patience to bear up under it, whatever the trial, whatever the affliction. And know that for Christ's sake, you deal with us in tenderness and mercy. I pray that as we continue our time of worship, our hearts will truly be drawn to your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. You've been listening to the Grace Abounding Broadcast brought to you by the Congregation of the Shreveport Grace Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. We meet at 2970 Baird Road and invite you to join us each Sunday beginning at 10 a.m. For more information, please visit our website at www.shrevegrace.org or call 318-687-4943. Please plan to join us again next week.